come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. We welcome you to the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights virtual service. We offer many online services for you to experience all week long. Join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. for Sunday School led by Reverend Caton on Zoom. On Mondays to replay Sunday Sermon and enjoy biblical highlights as you watch. Tune in to Flashback First Baptist on Tuesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. Then on Wednesday evenings, enjoy sound biblical teachings and great discussions during our Pastor and People Bible Study at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. On Thursday, start your day off right with our morning prayer call at 7 a.m. On first Sundays, when you tune into our services, you can commune with us. Well, we have given you the menu, and the spiritual table is set. All you have to do is eat up and enjoy. You are here. You are here. Thank you for being here today. While you're here, hope you hear something that inspires It's a high honor and a distinct privilege to be with you all today in this sacred virtual space at the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights to celebrate and lift up the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for such a time as this. The last few days, the last few months, the last few years haven't been easy. But there still is a whole lot for us to be thankful for on today. I'm just thankful that God woke us up this morning and started us on our way. I'm thankful that we made it through a difficult year. I'm thankful for the Reverend Rashad Raymond Moore, the senior pastor of this great house of worship. He's a good man, a hardworking man, a well-educated man, a community-centered man, a Morehouse man, and a mighty man of God. That's a powerful combination. I'm thankful for the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights, my church home away from home. I'm thankful that January 20th is almost here. The twice impeached president is on his way out and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are on their way in. And I'm thankful that through it all, we still serve a good God. There was a word from the Lord on today that comes from Numbers, the 13th chapter, verses 25 through 33. Numbers, the 13th chapter, verses 25 through 33. Hear ye now the word of the Lord. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, 
and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. I want to speak for just a few moments under the theme, a setback is nothing more than a setup for a comeback. A setback is nothing more than a setup for a comeback. These are challenging times filled with trials and tribulations. There is pain, there is suffering, and there is death throughout the land. America is confronted with four different challenges, all converging at the same time. First, the COVID-19 pandemic, a once-in-a-century public health crisis that has taken the lives of more than 350,000 Americans. Second, an economic recession triggered by the coronavirus that has left millions of Americans unemployed, hungry, and on the brink of homelessness. Third, a racial justice crisis reinforced by the brutal murders of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, who was killed with a knee to his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Finally, a violent insurrection, an attack on the U.S. Capitol, incited by Donald Trump, the so-called President of the United States. Challenging times. America is in the desert right now. In our text for today, the Lord instructed Moses to send 12 individuals, each a leader from the tribes of Israel, to scout out the promised land of Canaan, which the Lord had given to them. At the end of 40 days, they came back from exploring the land. Ten of the leaders reported that the land did flow with milk and honey and with bountiful fruit. They expressed concern, however, that the people who lived in the land were powerful and the cities were fortified. But Caleb, one of the leaders, along with Joshua, who had a different perspective, silenced them and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Let me park right there for a moment and make my first observation. The Israelites were in the desert of Paran. That's not a good situation to be in given the atmospheric conditions. A desert is hot, scorching temperatures. A desert is dry, no water to be found. A desert is barren, no fruit available to sustain you. It's an Old Testament version of the situation we find ourselves in right now in America. But that's when you need to think big. We're in the desert trying to get to Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Giants are in the way. Thankfully, Joshua and Caleb were there to make it clear that even though the situation may have seemed hopeless to some, we can certainly do it. In challenging times, you need to think big. The start of the modern-day civil rights movement began in 1956 when Rosa Parks had enough with institutional segregation. She sat down in the white section at the front of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. At the time of the arrest of Rosa Parks, Dr. King was just 26 years old and the emerging leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association. No reason for him to believe that things could change. Montgomery was a segregated city. He was in the heart of the Jim Crow South, the KKK acting with impunity. Domestic terrorists were everywhere. There were giants in the land. 
and the civil rights activists seemed like grasshoppers. But Dr. King had a dream that justice would roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Inspired by the courageous act of defiance by Rosa Parks, he launched the Montgomery bus boycott, successfully desegregated the city, and struck a blow against Jim Crow, which sent shock waves across the South. In challenging times, you need to think big. Moses thought big. Joshua thought big. Caleb thought big. Rosa thought big. King thought big. Chisholm thought big. Obama thought big. In challenging times, you need to think big. That's my first observation. In challenging times, you need to think big. Life, of course, is a journey filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, peaks and valleys. One of the reasons why so many folks don't like to fly is because they recognize that at some point along the way, when they're up in that plane, they are likely to encounter turbulence. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Up in the air, 30,000 feet high, plane starts rocking back and forth, no place to go. It's at that moment when everybody on the plane gets religion. Folks start praying, Lord, just plant my feet on solid ground. What am I trying to say? You can't get from your point of departure to your point of destination without at some moment along the way encountering turbulence. Now let me put it another way. You can't get from the desert of Paran to the land of Canaan without having to overcome some giants along the way. COVID-19 is a giant. White supremacy is a giant. An out-of-control president is a giant. You can't get from the desert of Paran to the promised land of Canaan without having to overcome some giants along the way. The text says that Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But then the 10 other Israelite scout leaders spoke up and said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We seem like grasshoppers to them. So the 10 scout leaders, other than Joshua and Caleb, spread among the Israelites a bad report. That happens sometimes. Uh, whenever you're on the verge of a breakthrough moment, trying to get from your point of departure to your point of destination, there will always be some folks in the crowd who express doubt about your ability to make it through. Former Vice President, I often point out, once called these types of individuals nattering nabobs of negativism. Uh, they are persistent pessimists, notorious naysayers, cantankerous critics, Debbie Downers, ants at a picnic, folks who, whenever you're on the verge of a breakthrough moment, doubt your ability to make it through. That often happened to, to Dr. King in 1963. There were folks who told him, don't go to Birmingham. A desegregation campaign will never work there. Bull Connor is in Birmingham. Bloodthirsty dogs are in Birmingham. Billy clubs are in Birmingham. Slow down, Dr. King. You're moving too fast. They gave him a bad report. Uh, whenever you're on the verge of a breakthrough moment, there will always be people around who will doubt your ability to make it through. That's what happened in the desert of Paran. That's what happened to Dr. King in Birmingham and throughout his career. That's what's happening in America right now. There are people spreading falsehoods, uh, even in our own community. Black people can't get COVID. 
Don't trust the vaccine. Trump's going to win a second term. He'll be back again in 2024. You can't win two Senate seats in Georgia. People who are spreading a bad report. But the text teaches us that when confronted with a bad report, all you really need is a few good men like Joshua and Caleb, or better yet, a few good women like Kamala and Stacy to dismiss the doubters. That's my second observation. When faced with a bad report, we need some real folks to dismiss the doubters and make it clear that everything is going to be all right. That's what Dr. King did when he wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail and responded to his critics who wanted him to slow down. And he said, wait has almost always meant never. Dismiss the doubters. One of my favorite Americans is Harriet Tubman. She was known for having a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. Uh, she, she, she's the original black sheriff. Harriet Tubman freed herself from slavery and then went back across the Mason-Dixon line an additional 19 times, freeing more than 200 black slaves. But at the end of her life, when she was asked about her heroics, Harriet Tugman was dismissive and said, I could have freed more if they only knew that they were slaves. I think I just said something. I could have freed more if they only knew that they were slaves. There's some folks who find themselves in a tough situation and liberation is upon them, but because of self-doubt, self-hatred, or a lack of self-awareness, they remain trapped in their difficult circumstances, trapped in the desert, trapped in slavery, trapped in Jim Crow, trapped in despair with the current occupant of the White House, trapped in a bad relationship, trapped in a dead-end job, trapped on your couch feeling bad for yourself, trapped on the street corner hustling, trapped in a tough situation. Am I talking to somebody right now? Liberation is at your doorstep, but someone gives you a bad report. I just stopped by to tell you that after you think big, you have to be prepared to dismiss the doubters. We're almost out of here. One last point, and then I'm through. After the Israelites spread among the community a bad report, the people began to raise their voices and wept aloud. They felt sorry for themselves, wishing they had died in Egypt. They started asking why the Lord had brought them to the land only to let them fall by the sword. They even threatened to impeach Moses and choose another leader. Then Joshua had enough. He said to the entire Israelite assembly, do not be afraid of the people in the land of Canaan because we will devour them. Their protection is gone because the Lord is with us. In other words, Joshua made clear that when confronted with a bad report, the final thing you've got to do is march forward faithfully. That's my last observation. When you have the chance to cross over into a better situation, even if there are giants in the way, don't give up. Don't turn back. Don't start panicking. March forward faithfully. Yes, 2020 was a rough year. We lost so many iconic people. Kobe Bryant, Chadwick Bozeman, the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, David Dinkins, John Lewis, and so many more. I had the honor of serving with the Honorable John Lewis for almost eight years. When I arrived in Congress, I'll never forget our first encounter. He approached me on the floor of the House and said, are you the new guy? I said, yes, sir, because everyone called John Lewis, sir. He said, you're from Brooklyn, right? Now, I was tempted to say, Brooklyn is always in the house. Uh, but since it was the Honorable John Lewis, instead I said, 
Yes, sir. And then Mr. Lewis said, I hear good things about you, but Washington is a tough town. So don't get into any trouble unless it's good trouble. John Lewis is with the angels now, but we continue to be inspired by his life, his lessons, and his legacy. One of the things I learned from him is that when confronted with a bad report, one of the best things you can do is to march forward faithfully. Go get into some good trouble. That's exactly what Dr. King and John Lewis did in 1965. Uh, in January of that year, Dr. King came into Selma, Alabama to elevate the campaign for voting rights and decided shortly after arriving that it was necessary to have a march in the segregated city of Selma with the racist and brutal sheriff Jim Clark. Giants in the land. The marchers were planning to make their way from Selma to the capital city in Montgomery. It was scheduled for March 7th, but then unexpectedly Dr. King had to be out of town. Uh, back then, a young John Lewis was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And so it fell to him on day one to lead the march with one of Dr. King's closest associates from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And the plan was Dr. King would join the marchers on day two in what was expected to be a five-day journey. On March 7th, John Lewis stood with hundreds of folks behind him to walk from Selma to Montgomery. At the beginning of the route, they had to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. As soon as they got to the base of the bridge, there were some Alabama state troopers waiting for them. Giants in the land. State troopers turned on the peaceful protesters. They chased them down like dogs. Beat them with billy clubs. Unleashed tear gas on them in an American city. John Lewis almost lost his life. They were beaten, bruised, and battered in what became known as Bloody Sunday. Dr. King arrived in Selma that night. Despite the American carnage and the potential for more violence, he decided that the march would resume and called upon people of goodwill throughout the country to join him. And the people came. Dr. King decided that they were going to march forward faithfully. And so on that Tuesday, they began the march from Selma to Montgomery. Upon arriving in Montgomery a few days later, a place where Governor George Wallace resided, Dr. King called upon Congress to pass the historic Voting Rights Act later on that year. Congress did just that. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you just have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. We've come this far by faith. Let me try to illustrate the point on January 6th, a violent mob attacked the U.S. Capitol, incited and encouraged by the so-called president. I was on the House floor during the start of the insurrection when the mob tried to breach the chamber. The sergeant at arms interrupted the debate, told us the mob was close, and to secure the gas masks that were underneath our seats. I then turned to Colin Allred, a fellow member of the Congressional Black Caucus, who was seated behind me at the time. By profession, Congressman Allred is a civil rights attorney. Uh, but before going to law school, he played linebacker in the National Football League for five years. If you ever find yourself in the middle of a violent insurrection, it's good to have an NFL linebacker by your side. I turned to Allred, who says to me, I don't know about you but I'm not going down without a fight. Uh, the next thing I knew, the suit jackets of everybody in our section, myself included, started coming off. It was a Joshua and Caleb moment. Uh, shortly thereafter, we were evacuated to an undisclosed location while the Capitol was being overrun. After a few hours, I announced to my colleagues from that undisclosed location 
that as soon as the Capitol were cleared, we would be returning to the floor of the House that night to complete our work and certify the election of the next president. I must have had this text in mind, whether there was danger or not, mob rule would not prevail. We were going to move and march forward faithfully. We returned to the chamber, and at 4 a.m., we certified the election of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States of America. Think big, dismiss the doubters, march forward faithfully. Let me end with this thought. In this great moment of uncertainty, I'm reminded of the time that Frederick Douglass in the 1850s was at a meeting of anti-slavery activists and he expressed frustration with the slow pace of the abolitionist movement. Frederick Douglass had the floor and made the observation that in his view America would never have the courage to deal with the question of slavery. A hush fell over the room. But then Sojourner Truth stood up. She respectfully disagreed with her fellow freedom fighter by asking him a question that she knew the answer to. She said, Frederick, is God dead? Frederick, is God dead? Sojourner Truth didn't have a master's in divinity or a doctorate in theology, but she knew that God was alive and well. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, to be there for us whenever we find ourselves in a tough spot. Let's just check the record. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tossed into a fiery furnace, Jesus was there. When two blind men needed sight in Matthew 9 and 27, Jesus was there. When a young woman was about to be stoned by an angry and hypocritical mob, Jesus was was there when the disciples were about to be tossed into the Sea of Galilee because a violent storm suddenly struck. Jesus was there when Rosa Parks sat down on that bus in the heart of the Jim Crow South. Jesus was there when Dr. King completed the march from Selma to Montgomery. Jesus was there when Barack Obama was on his way to the White House as the first black president of the United States of America. Joe Biden wasn't his only running mate. Jesus was there when Kamala Harris takes that oath of office on January 20th at high noon, Jesus will be there. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. He's a living Savior. He's a living Savior. He's a living Savior. God is alive and well. So whenever you find yourself in a tough spot, you know what to do. Think big. Dismiss the doubters. March forward faithfully. A setback is nothing more than a setup for a comeback. Happy King Day.